you are muted i think good morning vinu good morning vinu parka everyone good morning yeah. Yeah. so uh, welcome all of you so, this is 37 professor r anand krishnan kalokiam yeah. and today we are having dr vinu most of the days he is the host today he is the guest he will be the speaker vinu joined in 2011 iitm yeah. presently heading desk also academic cell and also uh, is leading a group in biogeochemistry so we know definitely will take us from surface of the ocean to deep in the indian ocean right i uh, will unravel many interesting features welcome vinu and uh, floor is yours thank you patochi very good morning to all of you uh, it is a very great opportunity for me to give a talk in ananta krishna colloquium series i'm very glad and uh, so as you may be knowing in itm that uh, we are working on uh, uh, ocean biogeochemistry so it has been a long since i gave a talk in this institute so it is also a good time that to tell our recent research activities in ocean uh, biogeochemistry so uh, in this talk uh, i will not uh, discuss the whole research activities that we conduct here but we will i will focus uh, only on one aspect of uh, uh, a particular research we have done very recently uh, which involves the indian ocean um, climate say for example indian ocean dipole for variability that most of you are familiar with i am very sure about it so this may be a, an a interesting topic for the audience also so uh, uh, without telling much about uh, in the introduction i let me go directly to my presentation so i will share my uh, slides now uh, i hope you are seeing my slide uh, not yet not it not it no. I hope you are seeing my slide now. Yes, yes, it is good. Good. Yeah, good sir. So the, today I am going to talk about the uh, impacts of Indian Ocean dipole in the Indian Ocean carbon cycle. So this is a uh, collaborative work by myself and uh, Sriyush, who was our uh, research associate in IITM, and uh, Kunal Chakrabarti from uh, Incoits, Hyderabad. So this is a very recent work, which is uh, right now uh, just revised in uh, GGR Oceans. so uh, the contents of my today's talk is i will give a brief introduction to the indian ocean carbon cycle and uh, the variability of indian ocean carbon cycle the audience especially iit may not be very familiar with the carbon cycle as such and especially indian ocean carbon cycle which also has not got many attention so far so i will give a very brief introduction about those and i will introduce the concept of iod that i am sure everybody aware of it what is iod and then my job is to link iod and indian ocean carbon cycle how they are linked for example iod how they impact the carbon cycle then i need to figure uh, to to highlight what are the fundamental difference between indian ocean and pacific ocean carbon cycle so we have noted the indian ocean carbon cycle uh, can can say that it's primarily driven by in iod and pacific on the other hand is driven by enso however in operation these two Uh, climate indices impact the carbon cycle totally in a different way that is what i am going to highlight in this particular talk so uh, let me start with what is iod so perhaps this everything start from this paper uh, maybe 20 years ago saji et al 1999 nature so this is a key figure we can depend on to i to find out to understand what is indian ocean dipole mode so what they have noticed so uh, like in the pacific that time indian ocean were not identified as having an, an a variability of its own in the in in, in interannual time scale so what they have noted is that uh, during um, uh, some years for example in the may june they started uh, observing uh, a strength in the easterly wind anomalies especially in the southeastern part of the tropical indian ocean which leads to a kind of upwelling and cooling of the sst there and because of this cooling in the east and uh, and, and, uh, and the subsequent ocean dynamics which bring more warm water to the west and a warming in the west 
further develops a, a gelatinous kind of feedback within the tropical Indian Ocean system, which further enhances the wind, and this goes on into a positive feedback and evolves into a matured state of cold anomalies in the southeast tropical Indian Ocean and warm anomalies in the west, with the strengthened easterly wind anomalies at the southeast to the equatorial region. So this is a fully evolved state. Say, for example, September to, September to October um, uh, months, you will see a fully evolved state of this coupling. And eventually, this coupling gets breaks and then it's demise. So you can see by November, December, these uh, uh, SST anomalies uh, disappear and wind anomalies start to demise. So this is uh, the straightforward uh, introduction to the Indian Ocean dipole mode. This occur in some years in the in, in, in the Indian Ocean. And there was there has been a lot of scientific interest built around this IOD because why? Because some, some people argue that Indian Ocean dipole is a totally an independent mode of uh, variability exists within the Indian Ocean. And some other argument came, no, it is actually induced, it is it is a it's some some slave to the Pacific variability. The ENSO itself is controlling the Indian Ocean dipole mode. And so many uh, literature started appearing in the scientific community. And some other people argued, for example, uh, Indian Ocean Dipole itself can in impact ENSO. There is a feedback from Indian Ocean to uh, Pacific as a, a feedback we, we can establish. So whatever it is, uh, this uh, um, uh, finding out this anomaly was very important for the Indian uh, climate research, especially Indian monsoon research, because usually we uh, see that when the, uh, this is a fully evolved state of a uh, positive IOD, we can we call it. So during a, such a positive IOD, we usually get a, an enhanced precipitation during our summer. So it was giving some kind of a predictive capacity to our, uh, our uh, monsoon rainfall. So that was uh, a, 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 a mystery that has got solved by identifying this mode of variability in the Indian Ocean. Otherwise, Indian, Ocean, Indian monsoon was thought to be controlled by ENSO and uh, however the correlation was relatively weak. It was not fully explaining the variance of the Indian monsoon. But when IOD came into picture, it got a little more uh, 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 a predictive tool that whether Indian monsoon can be, can, can be associated with IOD and we can have a more understanding how the rainfall is going to vary. So this is the beginning of the Indian Ocean dipole and uh, dipole mode uh, research in the scientific community. And for last 20 years, people are still figuring out how this is this mode uh, is useful in in the in the prediction of the summer monsoon. Or how this mode is useful in prediction of the uh, in the in the Pacific, for example. So all those sorts of research is going on. So uh, what is the context of our work? However, we are not going further into the physical dynamics of IOD, etc. But I can introduce this as it has been a long pending issue to look at the IOD impacts in the Indian Ocean and carbon cycle. Why is it so? Because due to the lack of direct observation, there was not as as many observations happening in the Indian Ocean carbon cycle to understand how these variabilities are linked with the climate variabilities. Okay? And another reason is that due to limited duration of model simulations, meticulously targeting how to identify the impacts of IOD in the Indian Ocean, there was not much of a studies uh, happened in the past. Uh, and another reason is that uh, in the carbon cycle, there are uh, several other signals are exist in the Indian Ocean. For example, decade and long-term trends. Long-term trends is due to the anthropogenic reason. And decadal cycle also built into it. So all these kind of getting uh, mixed up each other and to, to clearly discern the variability of carbon cycle with respect to the IOD alone become a challenging task. So that there was no much attention has given in this particular area. So that is our con uh, the context of our work. So now let me introduce uh, what is the upper ocean carbon cycle mean by. So uh, as you all know that ocean is a very active medium biologically. So there are uh, um, uh, biological processes happening in the upper ocean. So here in this schematic, I show you the upper 100 meter of the ocean. You can call it as a euphotic zone where the light is pro uh, is uh, available for photosynthesis to occur. So what we can see that with the presence of sunlight, with the available nutrients, say nitrate, phosphate, and uh, carbon and other nutrients, the phytoplankton produce to make photosynthesis and produce biomass. So this is the called the biological production or biological synthesis of carbon into in the organic form. So what happens after that the biological mass sinks downwards, so we, we can call it as a biological pump. So it has basically two, uh, so the soft tissue part and the carbonate pump part. Soft tissue means that those are 
organic matter which decompose which which does not have the calcium carbonate component in it which uh, which also uh, sink downward we can call it as an export and the heart tissue part is the calcium carbonate part which also export downward so what happens the interior uh, below the euphotic zone you can see that bacteria decomposes this organic matter and return the nutrient back into inorganic form and this nutrient however has to be returned back to the surface by dynamical reasons say for example entrainment mixing upwelling etc unless otherwise this loop is supplied uh, this complete the upper ocean productivity production cannot be supported so that is why the biological looping cycling is important in the upper ocean carbon cycle now what happens to the chemistry so we know that if you expose the carbon dioxide gas to the water it can get dissolved in the ocean due to chemical reactions so dissolution of carbon dioxide gas into um, into the water in terms of dissolved aqueous gaseous forms and carbonate and bicarbonate so this uh, the wind atmospheric wind also help, helps in this uh, the chemical dissolution uh, so we can call it as a uh, solubility pump so there are solubility pump acting upon and in the surface which exchange the carbon from the atmosphere to the ocean and biological pump synthesize this carbon into biomass and uh, export interior and the bacteria return them back to inorganic and uh, dynamics bring them back to the surface so this is a simple schematic carbon representation of the approaching carbon cycle but this is represented simply however in the real process there are a lot of other biological process regulates or limits this approaching carbon cycle so now let us bring the concept of iod and indian ocean carbon cycle because we need to link these two so what is the kind of a mean state of the tropical indian ocean you can see in this uh, cartoon so here i show the indian ocean as a tropical region from 10 degrees south to 5 degree north and from west to east so uh, and a black thick line shown is kind of you can call it as an isotherm or thermocline so what happens indian ocean unlike the pacific or atlantic the tropical indian ocean thermocline is flat we all know because of the dominance of the annual mean westerlies experiencing over the equatorial region because of we have a very flat uh, isotherm structure and the mean profiles of dic is or dic means dissolved inorganic carbon with the depth if you for example in the eastern tropical indian ocean carbon concentration increases as you go down alkalinity which is another element which controls the carbon uh, carbon pump in the upper ocean which also increases with depth and however temperature decreases with depth. this is kind of a mean profile then what happens during iod so this is what happens during the iod there is a development of a southeasterly wind anomaly to the equatorial each of the equatorial wind anomaly develops what happens it excites kelvin waves and ross waves in the upper ocean then your isotherm started to uh, to to have a slope that it is started to slope and in the east you experience a upwelling right and due to this upwelling what will happen to this mean profile of carbon alkalinity and temperature you can see that the cold water going to come to surface the carbon rich subsurface water is going to come to surface alkalinity rich water going to come to surface though these are our expectation for how iod may interact with the indian ocean carbon cycle and have some imprint of or imprints its anomaly on it so a important component in the upper ocean carbon cycle is the pco2 which is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide okay which is proportional to the concentration of dissolved inorganic carbon and the partial pco2 is inversely proportional to alkalinity if alkalinity increases pco2 decreases and uh, vice versa and pco2 is proportional to temperature if it's more warm temperature the partial pressure of carbon dioxide gas in the dissolved medium will increase now pco2 is also proportional to biology raised to n where n is equal to minus 1 if it's a soft tissue pump or n is equal to plus 1 if it's a hard tissue pump soft tissue means the soft organic matter which should export downward hard tissue means the, the, the shell component the cell skeleton component which involves calcium carbonate which is called the hard tissue part so that has a opposite impact so biology itself has a contradictory impact on the pco2 variabilities now if this is the kind of a main picture so one would naturally examine the dominating factor among these during iod that is what one should sup uh, supposed to do so uh, now let me take you through some of the uh, literature existing in this particular subject say past studies on iod 
and the chlorophyll interannual variability this has been attempted for example during the satellite era since 1997 and onwards we have satellite chlorophyll the upper, upper ocean chlorophyll is available and people have looked at for example 97 98 was a very prominent iod time in the indian ocean so what happened to the chlorophyll concentration so they the curry et al paper noted in 2013 come up with a, a composite of chlorophyll anomaly during the peak iod time they uh, noted that there is a Uh, there is an enhancement of surface chlorophyll in the in the south in the southeast indian ocean near java sumatra coast due to the upwelling and they noted this is kind of expected because of the iod you expect more nutrient to surface and more chlorophyll to form and if they, uh, they when they checked it with the chlorophyll for iod composite in the model then also they, they say that the model is able to reproduce such a signals in the uh, in the uh, observed satellite data and uh, say murthu data for example also come up with uh, an idea of chlorophyll increase during the iod time in 97 98 period now another study on carbon cycle per se however the previous study was about chlorophyll they are not of chlorophyll and carbon cycle are different because carbon to chlorophyll ratio itself is a challenge is they say people say 50 or some people say from 30 to 130 it can vary so carbon cycle per se who did some about what are the previous study there are not many study exist in this area one study notable done is by sharma in 2006 that too in the arabian sea for by the direct observation so what they have noticed that in arabian sea photic zone photic zone means the upper few hundred meter of the upper few tens of meter of the ocean the integrated primary production decreased by 30 percentage during iod of 97 98 compared to an average year whereas pco2 level were higher by 10 to 20 micro atmosphere albeit with 10 percentage reduction in sea to air change due to weaker winds this is a kind of a conclusion they have arrived so they noted that iod kind of impact in the in the in the in the indian ocean carbon cycle another study we have attempted the same subject in our limited a uh, duration of model simulation in the past in versala versala and maxisto in 2013 for example so what we have noticed uh, that the pockets of interannual variances in the indian ocean carbon cycle is where we have maximum seasonal variances so that they are kind of co-locating and we did not see a clear signal of interannual variance in the iod in east southeast tropical indian ocean probably due to the limited duration we depend upon in those studies also perhaps due to the weaker variability of, uh, induced by iod in the carbon cycle as such however there is no way we can verify this in the direct observation this is the observationally constructed seasonal variances this is the model constructed interannual variances so we this show that because the season, wherever the seasonal amplitude of the carbon cycle is larger the variation to that can imprint certain interannual variability in the indian ocean so and we noticed that the arabian sea carbon cycle variability is a mix of both iod and enso complementarily contribute to the arabian sea co2 flux interannual variability that is one of the past studies uh, done in the indian ocean so in another study in our own study looked at the carbon cycle variability in the solubility pump region for example the jayar center region where biology hardly have any role the uh, the chemical solubility directly control the carbon cycle we show that there are large decayable signal also built up in the indian ocean carbon cycle this is what i was mentioning in the beginning such decayable signals along with the anthropogenic trend we makes it very difficult to discern any types of uh, you know subtle interannual variability exist in the tropical to subtropical indian ocean so this is becoming a challenge so in this study we show that in the oligotrophic region where biology is less active the solubility pump you know selectively uh, injects the carbon anomalies into the interior of the ocean following a decadal signal so this has been published in uh, in 2012 from uh, from our own research so what we have shown here that in the south subtropical indian ocean the solubility pump dominates in controlling c2 air co2 fluxes and its decadal variability whereas Uh, below 40 degrees south where biology is a player there we can see that both biology and solubility pump is kind of an equal player so uh, now uh, the, by literature review we don't find clear association of iod especially in the pockets that we expect iod should have, have a control in the indian ocean carbon cycle we do not get we have no study actually clearly uh, illustrating this except, except for the chlorophyll concentration so we have addressed these three basic question in our study so uh, what is the impact of iod in the indian ocean carbon cycle as retrievable from available observations as well as from a model of more extended simulation what controls the carbon cycle variation
ability associated with the IOD and what are the similarities and differences in the IOD linked carbon cycle variability which may exist in the southeastern tropical Indian Ocean. We are not very sure before the beginning of this particular research but we anticipate it should have some impact so we should look at the model with longer simulation and, uh, and uh, bring out the variability of our interest. So in comparison with the ENSO linked variability in the tropical East Pacific. So how they are um, uh, compare each other. So these are the three questions we addressed in this particular study. So what we have to do is that we need to assign certain model data uh, in this study. So what we have done is we taken the observational PCO2 based on neural networks, uh, uh, SOM based product by Lanchester in 2016. It's a self-organizing map based gap filling data. So data for PCO2 in the Indian Ocean is a huge void. So what we can do best is to understand the the proxy variables, say for example, SST and MLD, how they control tropical PCO2. From there, we can build certain neural network relations and use the available existing PCO2 to try to fill the gap and come up with kind of a monthly uh, time series of a longer record uh, based on this NN SOM based. So this kind of a model derived data is not a pure observational data. Okay. Now, second, we take the world of natless biochemical variables for the both the model initial conditions and validation. And our major uh, working tool here is the OTTM plus biogeochemical general circulation model outputs. So we have our own biogeochemistry model working in this institute. So we have simulated it for 60 years from 1961 to 2019 to look at how the IOD controls the uh, carbon cycle variability. So now I will introduce what is the model we use. Uh, here, what, what, what is the model we are using for this research? So this is called Ocean Tracer Transport Model and BGC uh, working at IITM. So this is a simple model in which the physics or the dynamics is, so, is not solving within this model, but we are borrowing it from a reanalysis ocean data. So this is an offline model. We, this model is used to derive only the tracers, say for example, carbon, nutrient, uh, and all other biogeochemical variables to uh, to find their evolution. So this is an offline model. So it is coupled with the biogeochemistry by OR et al. So OR et al biogeochemistry is what OSIMIP2 biogeochemistry. I'm going to introduce what is it. And we have also made several modifications to this biogeochemistry in our past years of research. We have modified the net community production in CP depth by looking at the sunlight and chlorophyll, for example. We have introduced a new parameterization to, rep to better represent the seasonal variability in this particular model. So the physical model is an ocean tracer transport model by our past research. So this model is coupled with the biogeochemistry as you see here. So now what is the biogeochemistry model we have coupled here? It is a phosphate dependent nutrient restoration model. So if you are a carbonate chemistry person, you may be familiar with such model. So I let me simply introduce the basic production term in the upper ocean is actually looking at how the model phosphate is deviating from the observed world ocean atlas climatology. So this we can call it as a kind of a new production. So integral of this term for the entire euphotic zone, you can call it as a new production. So in the surface ocean, the biological fluxes is actually by the production type subtracted by the exporter so or the decator. Now, export production is calculated in this uh, particular method and uh, single phosphate is total single biological single phosphate is due to the export as well as the decay time. And uh, for the export, we have an export flux profile as uh, detailed here. So I'm not going to detail of this model. So what we have, this is an OSIMIP2 protocol by O et al 1999. It's a very pretty old protocol, but it works very good for the global ocean carbon cycle research. Now. Uh, we, we have uh, 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 modified this model by introducing a spatially dependent, you know, varying compensation depth in our past research. Because in, earlier in this model protocol, so you take a flat compensation depth that is going to work. But when we look at the oxygen profile in the ocean, such a flat compensation depth profiling is not accurate for depicting the seasonal cycle of carbon cycle of carbon in the in the model in the ocean so for that reason we have modified it in our own research so we have a spatially dependent chlorophyll light dependent compensation depth is this this is the depth over which the production happens or you can say this is the depth at which the community respiration balances the total production so that is very sensitive in the model to get the biological pump properly 
and uh, for the air sea flux calculation we have a uh, uh, we have terms for example exchange of air uh, carbon dioxide depending upon the sol the, sol the piston velocity which is a function of uh, wind speed and sst and carbon concentration and the difference of pco2 between ocean and the atmosphere we also have a water virtual water flux because when precipitation happens the carbon concentration dilutes in the ocean which affects the uh, air, air sea flux okay when when the precipitation is opposite I mean, opposite evaporation happen the carbon concentration uh, enhances in the ocean which affects the carbon exchange now alkalinity also has a uh, fresh water flux so which also to be included in the model this is all our standard protocol taken from manning cope's uh, old classical concept of air sea gas exchange now what are the input data we use we take data from gfbl coupled ocean data, data reanalysis uh, uh, ecds em 2.1 version which is available from 1960 to 2019 this has been updated during the uh, lockdown times so we have we are fortunate to get such a extended data until very recent to perform this experiments so input data required to run this model is you need a three dimensional velocity u v and temperature and salinity mixer layer depth pme precipitation minus evaporation wind stresses sea surface height and river runoff now these are the fundamental minimum requirement of data you need to run this model okay so uv t and s is for the hydrography and currents and mld is required to calculate the mixing coefficient using the forcing from the buoyancy forcing pme plus heat fluxes <coughs> i did not write a uh, short wave and long other fluxes here and to x the momentum forcing to x and to y will be used to de derive the mixing coefficients because they are not readily available with your reanalysis data right you need to derive your own vertical mixing coefficient so the model uses a k profile parameterization scheme hardware into the code which you <coughs> calculate the mixing coefficient and uh, calculate the mixing of uh, tracers and the edge evolution and the w the vertical velocity also seldom provided with the reanalysis data we calculate using the mass conservation within the each grid volume so the here the duration of the simulation is kept from 1961 to 2019 which is a 60 year in which the first 30 year we use as a 30 a spin up for the biogeochemistry which we done with the climatology derived from 1960 to 65 data uh, that many days of climatology we construct and we run the model for a spin up of 30 years. By the time your biogeochemistry get into kind of a Cauchy equilibrium stage, from there on you do the real time simulation. Now, the question here is how do you validate the transport of this model is accurate? You need to have certain validation to trust the transport derived by these offline currents and the parameterization of mixing, etc. They should be accurate. So, how do you find it? There is a, a tool or biogeochemistry people use, but they we depend upon some artificial tracer in the atmosphere. Say, for example, chlorofluorocarbon. We all know it started emitting in the atmosphere in the early 1900 due to the industrial revolution and use of refrigerant, right? CFC is used as a refrigerant and then since then the CFC started appearing in the atmosphere and since then CFC also started dissolving in the ocean. So what is the advantage of that? The atmospheric CFCs dissolve in the ocean and offer a very useful tracer for evaluating transport models. This is the basic principle. So what we can do is <coughs> we can simulate the um, uh, the, uh, the CFC concentration in the model, CFC does not have any biological component, it is completely inert, so it acts as an ideal tracer, okay. So I introduced CFC from 1940 and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, simulate the model with this atmospheric concentration of CFC, say for until 2000. What will happen then, uh, by 2000 your model will develop its own CFC concentration. Now we have observation of CFC in 2000, for example, or 1995, 1995, 1996, well ocean time, well ocean um, well, uh, circulation of whose cruises. Now they have meticulously sampled the CFC. So you compare your model CFC and observed CFC and see whether they are matching. If they are matching, then you say that achha, our transport is good enough. The parameterization of mixing, the subduction processes, interior injection of the tracers and its circulation interior are, are perfect. So doing such kind of validation, what we have done, I simulate CFC until uh, 2019 and uh, then calculated the inventory of CFC by the model and available observation during around year 2000. So you can see that the color shows the model inventory and contour shows the observed CFC 11 concentration. You can see that the vertically or integrated concentration shows a very nice match for the Indian Ocean. And if you examine a vertical section, say for example, an equatorial section, you can, because this East Equatorial Indian Ocean become important, now we are, we are talking about IOD and all. So let us check an ex, a cross section from the 
uh, west to east uh, along 5 degrees south. So this cross section from surface to, to, to 1200 meter, the color shows the model inventory of CFC and the contour shows the observed global data set. Okay, so they are kind of matching in here. So do if you examine a cross section in the north to south direction, say for example from 30 south to, to 0 degree north, and you can see that the injection of CFC in the subducted in the subducted water in the subtropic to so mid latitude to higher latitude, the water is get subducted and injected interior. Though that profile is very nicely captured by the model. So and uh, uh, this we can say so uh, this is a junction uh, for two cross sections are junctioning at uh, southeast Java sorry Java Sumatra coast. So that area your profiles are matching with the observation, meaning that your transport is okay to do a research. Now, uh, uh, we validated the carbon component of the model. So, we, first we compare the model C to air CO2 fluxes with the observation of Takahashi. But let me say that the observation means there is a large data gap in the ocean. So, they kind of try to gap fill using other proxies as much as available uh, in relation in our hands. So, that is how they fill the data gap in the in the ocean carbon in the, in the carbon cycle so anyway so if you the contour is shows the observation the color shows the model so the red means carbon comes out of the uh, model ups out of the ocean and the blue means the carbon uh, uh, gas goes into the ocean so you can see there's a fairly reasonable agreement especially for example in the june july august when you have a, a strong uh, upwelling season carbon rich car water comes to the surface and it emits a lot of carbon in that pocket in the western arabian sea so an observation and model are reasonably comparing in those uh, areas now in the right panel you can see the pco2 itself between the model and observation the contour is the from takahashi and the color is the model concentration of pco2 okay so they are also uh, reasonably matching and their seasonal cycle is comparable this also has been uh, analyzed in our previous work how seasonality improves in the indian ocean by new parameterization of compensation depths in the ocean in this particular model protocol etc we have analyzed now if you look at the what are the observations of pco2 available in the indian ocean this is a very big challenging question so this is the, the latest socat compilation of pco2 from the global ocean in which i have plotted the indian ocean part so the 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 color shows here the log scale of number of pco2 samples taken since 1970 to 2020 okay this is a very long time observational effort even then we have a very large data gap in the indian ocean we have not sampled the indian ocean pco2 for any uh, uh, reasonable uh, concentration for representing the seasonality very well especially the largest uh, observation happened uh, during 1995 during the jago era even uh, that's the paper are uh, still we are referring to those paper we don't have any update of that after that some bits and bits and bits of cruises happens in the indian ocean measure the pco2 so recently what we are proposing is that we have to install certain pco2 sensors in the indian ocean this work is actually under review we are we have done an oc experiment to calculate the uh, to find out which location which mooring location we can depend on which ship track we can depend on to sample the indian ocean pco2 but whatever observation when i talk about it has been compiled from this very uh, very coarse uh, resolution available okay and using some neural network and the self-organizing map field mechanisms now uh, this is the validation for the surface dic and alkalinity so you can see that uh, uh, it has a very good match the model shows the color uh, color shows the model and the contour is the observation you can see there is a, a regional uh, pattern ma matching reasonably well for the, the djf mam jj and son dissolved inorganic carbon between model and observation and this is the alkalinity alkalinity also reasonably reproduced in the model you can see in the arabian sea the tongue like shape in the alkalinity in the son seas and they are all reasonably coming in both in magnitude and uh, shape so and the precipitation enhanced the alkalinity dilution in the eastern tropical to bay of bengal you can see reasonably reproduced in the model so alkalinity alkalinity is a function of biology as well as the the, the chemical pumps okay so you need to have these two pumps along with the transport accurate to derive this these properties reasonably well in the model then uh, validation of the, this is again a validation i offer for the vertical section say for example the east west and north south section of the dic we need to have a proper thermocline structure of the carbon and alkalinity in the model to discuss about iod etc so they are compared here and they are also reasonably comparing for example the north south section of the dissolved inorganic carbon the contour is the observation and color is the model they are also reasonably represented in the model 
and this is alkalinity similar comparison i have done for the alkalinity vertical sections in the east west and the north south section so after doing this all this validation we can see that this model uh, results are trustable so we will now go ahead with the producing the interannual variability so here i have a, uh, we have depended on some simple evof analysis to find out the variability of the indian ocean um, uh, carbon cycle so furthermore i am also comparing here the phosphate profile especially at the java sumatra coast let's see whether the phosphate profile in the model is reasonable so phosphate in seasonal cycle where the model is shown by the black line observation is by the red line the annual mean subtracted so you can see that they are also reasonably comparing so the model biological pumps are doing a reasonable job in reproducing the new production and nutrient profile reasonably well in this particular pocket so we can trust the model results okay now what i do is i have also offered a comparison between area integrated fluxes that means the total flux of the indian ocean integrated over the indian ocean region between ottm our model and the neural network based self organizing map data field gap filled data by largest threshold which is available for a limited period so you see that there is a nice match coming this is in petagram carbon per year unit okay so you can see that there is a reasonable match both in seasonality and the long term variability between these two data products so that is giving kind of confirmation that okay our model is in the right direction we can uh, use this model of an extended duration to study the interannual variability of carbon cycle in the indian ocean now if i smooth this data to remove the seasonal cycle there are some matches but are mismatches also as a basing scale which is in our data product and peter landestress data product so the reason for that we will we will see in a later stage in fact the peter's data is showing very well match in iod with respect to ottm also we were surprised to see that i will show you that in a white now to before proceeding i have to calculate the iod represented in the uh, the data we used to drive the model so here shows the sst of the uh, so evof of the sst of the gfdl reanalysis data uh, in the uh, show in the upper panel you can see that uh, iod related cooling in the south southeast java sumatra to extended area is available and a warm sst is building up in the west you can see that also here and if i calculate the iod index of from the gfdl reanalysis data and hada sst they are also correlating with a correlation coefficient of 0.8 that means this uh, uh, this reanalysis data what we are using is reasonably representing the indian ocean and uh, dipole variability well so now let us look into the carbon cycle variability what we have done is first we have a constructed a climatology uh, anomaly by a moving uh, removing the moving climatology because i told the carbon cycle as such it has a trend the trend is due to the anthropogenic injection of carbon from the pre industrial era to today so that we need to systematically remove and the decadal variability also there as i we have uh, published in 2012 and all that also has to be removed so unless we remove all these uh, signals and retain our signal of interest which is say for example iod periodicity from 2 to 5 years of periodicity unless unless we do that we don't get this signal very well okay so i have here employed an anomaly calculation based on the uh, climatology moving climatology that means i take a 5 year climatology to to find the anomaly of a particular year then the next the anomaly of the next year i calculated with the climatology moved by an one year so that this 5 year indo climatology period is move ahead so this uh, I, i can share with the, uh, the people who are interested how we calculated this climate an anomaly and after doing that anomaly then we employed a simple eof analysis then we saw that there is a, a very nice signal or uh, uh, exist in the crc co2 flux or c2 air co2 fluxes in the indian ocean and that eof pattern is what shown here so we have a, a large positive signal of eof loading here and positive means carbon is coming out of the ocean so flux of carbon is from ocean to the atmosphere and the principal component of that is matching very well with the iod index at a correlation of 0.43 so what is this mean during positive iod the c2 air co2 flux sources of as large as plus or minus 1 mole per meter square per year is found in this southeast tropical indian ocean this is kind of an expected because we know that iod is related with the upwelling and subsequent westward propagation of anomaly so this is kind of expected and opposite polarity you can see somewhere in the north here okay 
And if you look at the PCO2, the AFC flux is a derivative of the PCO2 actually. So if you look at the PCO2 EOF in the Indian Ocean, they also have a leading mode, say it's around 14 percentage variance in which the AFC flux uh, PCO2 positive polarity is established in the southeast uh, to uh, westward is a tropical Indian Ocean with a maximum amplitude around plus or minus 20 micro atmosphere. And the principal component is matching with the correlation, uh, the IOD index at a correlation of 0.5. So this is a very interestingly, we were able to retrieve with the extended period of data that IOD signal is exist in the tropical Indian Ocean and uh, can be retrievable. Now let us compare this with the observation because Peter Blondestrate's data, neural network uh, SOM based data filling, they should also show some confirmation with our results. Otherwise, we cannot fully trust the model output. What we have done. The same EOF analysis extended for the observations also. So here, observation available only from 1985 to 2010 or 2015. Oh, sorry, 2015. Okay, so it's a limited period. There also we can see a very IOD induced PCO2 anomaly. In fact, exists in the data, uh, SOM based data field uh, gap field data. And here, however, up there amplitude is kind of half of what we get in the model. In the model, maybe slightly exaggerating this or the uh, SON based NN, N, sorry, NN based data set uh, data set has some demerit because very less data has gone into this neural network algorithm. So that can be a reason. However, what you, we have to notice that the patterns are very nice resembling. For example, a positive polarity and a negative polarity in between and a, a positive polarity again in the North Arabian Sea. They all are reproduced well and the correlation also reasonably represented between PC and the IOD index. So this is kind of a proof we can say that the IOD, in IOD has an impact in the Indian Ocean carbon cycle in the Southeast Tropical Indian Ocean. Now we can extend the same EOF analysis for other carbonaceous variables, say for example, the dissolved inorganic carbon and alkalinity, which is what I have shown here. So we see that dissolved inorganic carbon has a positive polarity here and uh, this unit is micro mole per kilogram. Okay, So uh, their PC and uh, uh, dipole mode index also correlate around 0.48 or something. So you can see that the carbon concentration increases during a positive IOD here. And uh, this is the alkalinity. Alkalinity concentration also increases during a positive IOD here. Now, um, then we, need, we can do some thought experiments. So what is our thought experiment is that uh, for a particular anomaly of uh, DIC or alkalinity and temperature, we have a certain idea how much the PCO2 can change by looking up to the Ravelli factors. So Ravelli factors is nothing but a sensitivity index for a given change in the carbon concentration or alkalinity concentration, how much PCO2 is going to change. So when we calculated for the southeastern tropical Indian Ocean, for a mean value of PCO2 360, DIC 1.9 mole per meter cube and alkalinity 2.2 mole per meter cube and uh, a delta DIC of 35 micromole per kilogram and a delta alkalinity of uh, for 22 micromole per kilogram, we expect a PCO2 change plus 63 due to DIC and minus 32 due to alkalinity. I told when alkalinity increases, PCO2 decreases. When DIC increases, PCO2 increases. So there is an opposite polarity of tendency for the PCO2 due to DIC and alkalinity. So the net change we expect plus or minus 30, uh, uh, 31 micro atmosphere. However, the PCO2 change due to IOD maximum coming only up to plus or minus 20. So around 10 micro atmosphere is unaccounted by the simplistic Ravelli factor induced to thought experiment. So what we have done, we looked at why this is happening. So the response of Southeast Indian Ocean carbon cycle during positive IOD. Let us do some thought experiment in this way. I introduced the mean profiles of carbon DI from surface to 200 meter alkalinity and temperature and biology. So this is kind of a mean profile. Okay, what is inclining to the left means surface is diluted than the deep. What is inclining to the right means surface is higher than what is in the deep. Now, what happens during a positive IOD? We know that the anomalies of DIC will look like this. That means the deep water goes to the surface in the southeastern Indian Ocean. So your DIC has to increase in the upper ocean, alkalinity has to increase, temperature has to decrease, and biology has to increase because chlorophyll satellite data tells that now biology is increasing. Now, we, due to this individual component, what is going to happen to PCO2? Due to DIC, PCO2 going to go up. Due to alkalinity change, PCO2 going to go down. 
due to temperature change also pco2 going to go down and due to biology change pco2 can either go up or down according to soft tissue or calcium carbonate pump tissue is dominating so to identify this thing we need a component analysis analysis what what biochemists depend upon is that we can decompose the total pco2 in terms of this individual component as a partial derivative so total derivative is sum of the derivative due to temperature component dac component alkalinity component and salinity component plus minor ions. I'm not going to talk about the minor ions here. Here, the biology is embedded in alkalinity and DIC because when, so when biology happens, alkalinity changes as well as DIC changes. So now what we can do is, <coughs> we can actually reconstruct the PCO2 in a controlled fashion in such giving the model DIC, alkalinity and temperature and salinity. Okay, so then we can reconstruct the control PCO2. In the second reconstruction, what we can do is, we can give the climatological temperature in the reconstruction. Then what happens? That will give a PCO2 T. That means T suppressed the reconstruction of PCO2. When if you subtract control minus the, the PCO2 T, you get a sensitivity of PCO2 due to temperature change. You should remember during IOD happens around 1 to 1.5 degree SST cools in the Southeast Tropical Indian Ocean or even more, uh, uh, for example, due to that PCO2 should change. So that change you will get in this way of reconstruction. The same method you can repeat for providing, repeat with providing climatological DIC to see the impact of DIC in the PCO2. Okay. Another method, reconstruction you can do for the alkalinity and biology also. Okay. Biology also you can control because you have a phosphate profiles in the model. You can convert it into equivalent of mole per meter cube in carbon and you can subtract out and do a reconstruction and calculate the biological component also in the PCO2. So when you do these four reconstruction, um, we can find out the impact of individual these terms, individual processes controlling the PCO2 anomaly in the Indian Ocean. When I did that, what we can do see that the, the temperature control, in, this is in unit of uh, PCO2, micro, uh, mi micro atmosphere, okay. This is axis is from minus 10 to plus 10. You can see that during the May, June, July, you started to see the temperature induced PCO2 is trying to weaken due to the beginning of the upwelling of I positive IOD. This is an IOD composite for positive IODs, okay. And due to during August, September, October, you can see a clear demarcation of a lowering down of PCO2 in the east, uh, southeast Java coast due to the enhanced upwelling and the SST is warming in the west. So you also see the temperature induced PCO2 increasing in the west and which demises further by November, December. And this is maximum comes around plus 10 micro atmosphere. And this is the 10 micro atmosphere. We were having a mismatch in the Ravelli concept. Now, when we added this temperature component to it, we were satisfied the Ravelli concept that yes, they are matching. But if you look at the DIC and alkalinity induced changes, you can from a single snapshot, you can see they are complementary to each other. So you can see here the axis is minus 100 to plus 100. So what happens during a peak IOD upwelling, the carbon enrichment induced PCO2 is larger by around 60-70 micro atmosphere and the alkalinity enrichment PCO2 decrease is around minus 30-40 micro atmosphere. So when you add these two, you get a net change, which is what I am going to illustrate here. So the component form of PCO2, if I average it over the southeast uh, Java Sumatra area around 70 east to 105 and 0 to 10 south box, what I can see here is that this is the DIC induced increase of PCO2, okay. This is the alkalinity induced decrease of PCO2, okay, red and green. They are going to they get cancel each other. And if you look at the biological in, induced, uh, for example, this is the biological blue component, the biological induced decrease of PCO2 is around minus 2 micro atmosphere only, but these amplitudes are much greater. That means the DIC and alkalinity dynamics is dominating the carbon variability by the IOD in the Southeast Tropical Indian Ocean. So the impact of temperature on PCO2 variability during IOD year is feasible. So where is the impact of temperature? It is roughly comes around 10 to 5, 5 to 10 micro atmosphere only, which is the black line. So the dominating factors are due to DIC and alkalinity. The biology component also contributes only a minimal variability to PCO2 due to IOD. So this is the biological component. So this is our uh, our conclusion uh, saying that uh, in the Indian Ocean, 
the PCO2 variability due to IOD is dominated by DIC and alkalinity dynamics. Now, let us contrast this with the tropical Pacific because tropical Pacific is the largest carbon cycle variability we find in the global ocean. So, if you see that our own model results in 2014 or uh, Rick Feely's results in 2004 and observations in the, from the past excerpts shows that during uh, El Nino happens, the carbon uh, emission weakens in the tropical Pacific. Rather, they become anomalously a carbon sink, which is because during El Nino, you know that there is a suppressed upwelling. So the enrichment of the upper ocean by the carbonated water is less because of that there is a sink of carbon in the tropical Pacific. But in the IOD, however, the similar mechanism, but in the opposite direction, because positive IOD means you have an enhanced upwelling and spreading in the southeast tropical Indian Ocean. Okay, so now this is the ENSO and the Tropical Pacific EOF and their principal component and, and uh, uh, this is IOD index and Tropical Indian Ocean EOF and its principal components. Now the fundamental difference is that uh, both are upwelling driven interannual variability region but there is a contrast in the Pacific the control of DIC and temperature dominates but in the Indian Ocean the control of DIC and alkalinity dominates. So why that difference? That is very curious to look at. So to answer that question, we can look at the solubility coefficients or the, in the, in the chemical kinetic equilibrium in, or the dissolution coefficients of the car, of carbon in the water. So carbon get dissolved in the ocean, carbon dioxide plus water in the first equilibrium is into bicarbonic acid, which splits into one H plus ion and bicarbonate, which again splits into one H plus ion and bicarbonate. So in this, this K0, K1, K2 are the dissociation constants acting in this uh, equation. They are temperature dependent. Now, if I plot the K0, K1, K2 of Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean with the temperature, I am getting this cross marked lines. That means Indian Ocean is on the right hand side. It is come because mean Indian Ocean SST is around 28 to 30 degree in the southeast tropical Indian Ocean because it's a par part of the western warm Pacific warm pool. Okay. But in the Pacific, the eastern tropical Pacific SST is much weaker because it is a climatologically mean upwelling region. So the, co the coefficients have extreme ends in the Pacific and Indian Ocean. So do the K1 and K2, the other coefficient also, Indian Ocean occupies in the one end, the Pacific Ocean occupies the other end. So what happens is PCO2 is proportional to basically K1 by K0, K2. Here K0, K1 and K2 are similar shape curve, they cancel each other in this ratio. So what is important is the K0. So as the temperature increases, the K0 decreases and PCO2 increases, okay. So that is how when temperature increases, PCO2 increases. So what happens is that range of temperature oscillation within the Indian Ocean is rather weak. So does the K0 component is weaker and the sensitivity of Indian Ocean carbon water to the temperature changes is rather weak. But on the other hand, Pacific has a large excursion of temperature due to the mean upwelling and the anomalies, you can see that the K0 varies a lot and temperature can dominate the carbon chemistry in the tropical Pacific. So let me read out these points. K1, K2, K1, K0, K1 and K2 are the dissociation constant for PCO2 uh, in the water, in the CO2 in the water. K0, K1, K and K2 are functions of SST. The Eastern Pacific Ocean mean temperature is cooler than Eastern Indian Ocean. Therefore, Pacific has more dependency on T than Indian Ocean. Pacific PCO2 has more dependency on T than Indian Ocean. So now the same metric we can plot, like a TS diagram, we biogeochemists people plot in an alkalinity DS plane in which PCO2 is drawn as the background line. So where also if you see the Eastern Tropical Indian Ocean uh, occupies a region with a large dilution in the alkalinity and DIC due to enhanced precipitation. We have a larger precipitation in the Eastern Tropical Indian Ocean compared to Pacific. These are the Pacific DIC alkalinity dots. They are kind uh, totally different from the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean DIC alkalinity lines are controlled by more of a dilution induced due to precipitation and evaporation because it is part of the western pacific palm pool and larger precipitation we receive and you see that the range of DIC and alkalinity going along a, a, a constant PCO2 line 300 micro atmosphere but in the pacific their variability from 400 to 500 so their variability is also much larger compared to Indian Ocean. This is a reason Indian Ocean interannual variability of carbon cycle is very difficult to find out. 
unless we have proceed in a manner that other variabilities are filtered out and bring out the subtle variability to the upfront so this is a way how we approach also important and this metric is a very useful thing to assess the carbon cycle variability of various part of the global oceans <coughs> So now if you look at the, uh, the precipitation impact in the Indian Ocean carbon cycle, this is the alkalinity water fluxes due to precipitation alkalinity changes, right, or DIC changes. They also have a similar polarity in terms of IOT. So I have now come to the conclusion. And uh, what is the conclusion we arrived by doing this pair work? The positive IOD corresponds to a positive C2 or CO2 flux anomalies in the southeastern Indian Ocean over a broad region of 70 east to 105 east and 0 to 20 degrees south. And the DIC and alkalinity are the leading complementary patterns of PCO2 variability during IOD with the net effect of dominated by dyna DIC dynamics. Okay? And temperature and biological components are found to have a negligible role in controlling PCO2 variability associated with IOD. The precipitation minus evaporation and river runoff fluxes are found to have a fundamental role in controlling DIC and alkalinity variability, followed by PCO2 variability in the southeast tropical Indian Ocean associated with IOD. To uh, this, the study for the first time identifies that in contrast to the eastern tropical Pacific, where the DIC and T control the variability of PCO2, in the Indian Ocean, DIC and alkalinity control the PCO2 variability. That is a, a contrast we found. And why this is happening? Because the, 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 the difference is because the basic structure in the buffering carbonate chemistry established in these two parts of the globalization are totally different. One is a highly precipitation driven mechanism, the other is mostly of upwelling driven mechanism. Okay, so that difference is there. So to the study uh, develops a comprehensive verification tool for carbonate chemistry simulated in climate model and their projection. We can use similar metric and diagnostics to see how the climate models perform. So the future directions can be the study can account. Um, uh, uh, one thing is that I, I, I did not discuss about any propagating anomalies I, because IOD is a propagating feature, right? We only look at the understanding mode so far. So we can do more complex EOFs and study the propagation mode, for example. However, the metric we developed can be used as an evaluation to how tool for how ESMs performs in the carbonate chemistry in the approach. So I uh, uh, thank here our director for supporting the BGC research in IITM and uh, uh, GFDL data is provided taken from there and uh, HPC is utilized for all these simulation etc and uh, anonymous reviewers also helped and I thanks also our group for uh, working on carbon related problems in the Indian Ocean and I thank all the audience for your patient listening I hope you understood if you have any doubts you are free to contact me and because it's a very limited time to explain all these things Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Vinu. Even though I am not, you know, at all anywhere near this, but very clear, excellent presentation. So there are many questions. Okay. And I have posted here, but before that, Professor Ravi, you wanted to ask or suggest any questions, comments? Uh, uh, I think it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, okay. I mean, in a okay, I don't know much about oceanography or uh, let's say even carbon fluxes. But uh, is it my is my understanding correct that whenever you have a region of large upwelling, you do get uh, more of a ocean to atmosphere uh, CO two fluxes? Is that right? It is correct. It is correct. It is right. So that means uh, ocean is not always a sink. It could be a source also. Is that's what it means? Definitely, uh, especially in the upwelling zone, there are a source of carbon to the atmosphere. Okay, so that means Eastern Pacific is generally, uh, I mean, in uh, in a climatological sense, I'm not talking exactly. about... Exactly, in a climatological uh, sense, they are uh, carbon source. uh, sources. Yeah. Okay, my other question is about CFCs. You know, now CFCs have been phased out, especially CFC 11, I think, has been phased out. Phased out. Yeah. How long can we use that as a tracer? I mean, at some point, you know, the, the, its concentration might start reducing. Very good question. Ah, very good question. So by 1994, the Montreal Protocol stopped the CFC and in the ocean we are started seeing from 97 onwards, CFC is declining. So until that point, uh, we can use CFC as a tracer. So, uh, so we validate our model in 1997-2000 boundary. Okay. 
So and for the concentration up until that is uh, reasonable, then means the rest of the dynamics will definitely be reasonable too because the history was proper in the model. So uh, now people are using halofluorofluorocarbon, which is recently uprising in atmosphere, which is giving a new uh, tracer uh, constraint in the in the ocean uh, circulation evaluation. So CFC not anymore. We can use uh, unless you you stop your analysis in 1997. You can check your transport in that particular period, and if that is okay, that is uh, not it can be validated. Thank you, Pravin. Yeah, excellent question. So, you know, you can read the chat box. The question yeah, there are some questions in the chat, and uh, let me go through it. Uh, I don't know how much I can answer, but I will try my best. So, a uh, question from Shilan How accurate and reliable are the export production assumed in the BGC model, especially in the absence of any data in the Indian Ocean region? See, so far the export production in this particular model is uh, calculated from the phosphate restoration approach. And uh, what we do is uh, we compare the primary production and we compare uh, the nutrient profile below the eupotic zone as a validation tool. As such, the export data, we do not have uh, observations to compare it very well. So that is a very challenging question and we do agree that Unless we do that also properly, we are we will not be able to accurately depict the variability. What we see is uh, is indeed the true variability. However, you should notice the PZO2 observation also shows similar kind of variability as I show in the neural network SOM based. So we may assume that the phosphate profile is so reasonable and uh, the new product the primary production is reasonable because chlorophyll we can compare. The carbon to chlorophyll ratio kind of tell you about the primary production is reasonable or not then export should be uh, more or less reasonable. Otherwise, we will not uh, get a proper uh, result. Now, the second question Dr. Sheenan asked, what is the source of river flux? Here, the GFTL reanalysis gives a river inflow in the data itself, what they have used in the computer data simulation. I think uh, it must be derived from their precipitation plus maybe it is nudged towards what is the output river. I'm not very sure I, I directly take the river flux as available in that uh, data product. Then Yogesh Tiwari asked, why whether DIC and affinity profile look different during IOD and ENSO even? Well, uh, it does. Um, as long as the upwelling is the mechanism, their responses to IOD or ENSO are in the same direction, but its consequence in the net PCO2 are in opposite direction. That is uh, uh, what we have uh, found out. So I did not get the question completely. Maybe we can uh, discuss more offline about that. Another question came from uh, Dr. Partha. Am I allowed to attend all the questions? Is the time is a constraint? Okay, I think uh, he's did not listen my question. So, well, next interesting question. It's up to you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Roxy has asked Are the are these scales in the validation slide different? No, I uh, validation slide. We did not use any different scale. Uh, we can share the uh, our uh, manuscript. Uh, we used the same scale only. Uh, maybe in the PCO2 of neural network and our model are different because I mentioned it, our model is half. Uh, I mean, exaggerated by fifty percent. That I already mentioned. But variability is that end is exactly the same. Then Dr. Krishnan asked. Uh, Thanks for the presentation. After uh, no. Nuclear test, bomb carbon used as a ocean tracer. Very good. Is there any specific reason for considering CFC 11? Sir, bomb carbon, if I use, I need to have a decay term and observation of bomb carbon in the Indian Ocean. I'm not very sure, but they are meticulously doing it. But CFC has much more coverage. Okay. So that is a reason I am depending upon CFC rather than bomb carbon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, for studying this in the uh, Atlantic deep ocean circulation, they use this. Uh, Bomb tracer. Bomb a, carbon as a tracer. Bomb carbon. Uh, uh, one thing that bomb carbon can give you a, a net overturning time scale, especially the water exchange from the upper to interior. Okay. If they have compare bomb carbon of two different uh, time they observe, say 1980 and two days. That may be a reason. That there is a calculation. Even I used to teach the students and. Uh, that may be the reason they are looking at bone carbon. Besides the CFC, as you said, uh, as a professor uh, Ravi also said, it is uh, phasing out. 
and the uh, concentration of CFC in the ocean is in pico mode. Radio bomb carbon may be higher, so accuracy of observation can be higher there too. Okay. This can be a reason they use a bomb carbon fourteen carbon fourteen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, uh, what is the rationale behind selection of optimum Rama location for BGC observation? I think Dr. Sheelan, this we have presented. My student just used presented. We have done some OC experiment using Bayesian inversion. And uh, with that, we have an incremental optimization algorithm implemented in the code. By doing so, we can come up with the optimal. The optimal we are looking by reducing the cost function of ARC flux error must be minima in a given uh, if observation is available in a given drama or a ship track data. So that is a basically inverse uh, inversion dependent uh, optimal OSSE work actually. So it is still not published as under review. Then uh, Dr. Nebanarayan Rao, can we use PCO2 variation to track variability of water masses? I don't think it's a good idea because PCO2 equilibrate quite quickly with the atmosphere. So to track a water mass variability better depend upon a tracer which doesn't change its concentration with the time, at least uh, in the interior. Besides, PCO2 is a pressure dependent parameter. It is a partial pressure now. So your depth of water mass itself will have changed PCO2. Now it seems the alkaline tongue in the Arabian Sea is showing similar path of Arabian Sea high saline water mass because salinity and alkalinity are tightly, they are actually dissolved ions except the sodium and magnesium, chlorine, etc. not involved. But other carbonaceous ions, they share the common pattern. That's why salinity is a proxy for alkalinity also. You can uh, make a linear or a nonlinear, uh, uh, what you call a regression fit of alkaline salinity to retrieve your alkalinity. That's a very good observation. That's because the ions are sharing a from a common family. Okay, so that's why they are looking very similar. And Roxy has asked how large are the trends in PCO2 over the IOD region, west and east? Are these trends larger than interannual variability? They they are, are larger because anthropogenically carbon is being injected from eight, uh, 18th century. So their in injection uh, will give a larger trend. Okay, so we have to detrend and I have a detrended and deseasonalized all the anomalies before proceeding with this uh, analysis. But if that methodology has any issue, uh, then please communicate to me and I will look into that. Yogesh was asking, is there any long term trend in Arabian Sea CO2 sink or salt? See, all part of the global ocean is building up a trend of sink. Why atmosphere is pumping up with a more carbon dioxide. Fossil fuel keep on increasing the atmospheric CO2 because of that ocean is increasing its sink capacity. But the trend of sink is being declined, being reduced in several parts of the ocean because of climate change. Because as the temperature increases, the ocean's capacity to dissolve carbon reduces. Okay, as well as when the global wind system changes, some places the upwelling may enhance, which also reduce the carbon sink capacity. So as far as the Arabian Sea is concerned, there is still an active sink of CO2, but there is a trend in the capacity of sink. There is a slight decline in the sink is recently noticed. Then uh, Dr. Krishnan again asked how comparable are the PCO2 variation during IOD and ENSO over the tropical Indian and Pacific Ocean. I, uh, Pacific Ocean offers around minus 0.5 to minus 1 petagram sink, which is which Indian Ocean is not. Indian Ocean is offering only a few teragram and uh, an order of magnitude uh, 3 less or so. Okay, so it's much less because Indian Ocean is a small basin and uh, the variability in the temperature from the mean state also slightly less as compared to Pacific in the Indian Ocean case. So that is also offering a very less total sink only. So that is a uh, uh, several order of magnitude less. Then Roxy again asked, since a large share of IOD are associated with ENSO, uh, it will be interesting to see PCO2 association with ENSO as well. I think he's referring to PCO2 of Indian Ocean and its association with ENSO. That's a good question. We can do some segregation analysis, pure ENSO, pure IOD and kind of analysis we can do. But one thing I want to tell here, ENSO impacts in the Indian Ocean, people often interpret very well if the, if the impact is coming through SST. But in the PCO2, what I am seeing is that impact is not just driven by SST, rather by dynamics. So uh, unless Indian Ocean is active with its own IOD, the dynamics won't be so different during ENSO in the Indian Ocean. I'm not, I don't know, I'm explaining it correctly, maybe I'm hurrying a little bit. It can be looked at, but I'm not very sure if you look at pure ISO years, pure IOD years, we will get any difference. I need to really look at to answer that. 
and uh, then uh, uh, questions continues so one um, question saying that uh, does pco2 here refers to co2 uptake or release uh, pco2 is a partial pressure of dissolved gas in the ocean okay it is just a partial pressure it does not imply uptake or release uh, the tropical regions are places where release of co2 take place that is correct if then AC interaction can play a vital role in changing CO2 content, is indeed that is the ocean is taking up the major chunk of water, especially 30 percentage of what man made carbon has gone into ocean. But tropics is contributing less as compared to middle latitude. They take up much more chunk than tropic can take because tropical SSD is warmer, just temperature increases, PCO2 increases, so solubility decreases or the exchange decreases. Okay, so but the other middle latitude and high latitude indeed take up carbon that's why the ocean uh, is helping atmosphere to mitigate the, uh, the long-term climate change and uh, Thamban has appreciated thank you Dr. Thamban and then uh, Supriyo has asked uh, so last question how do the ocean carbon fluxes affect terrestrial fluxes that's a big big question Supriyoji um, we, we don't have a clear idea how the ocean carbon affect the terrestrial carbon flux is an order of magnitude higher than ocean carbon fluxes so they are on the upper hand and the variability is also much much larger the petagram involved is much higher in quantity i don't think ocean, uh, you know atmosphere uh, terrestrial carbon flux even look at the ocean to to do any of its uh, to regulate any of its activities so i think uh, thank you so much for so many questions and uh, patiently listening to this talk and uh, i thank uh, dr partho for uh, uh, giving this opportunity for this antakrishna uh, colloquium I also thank all the audience join and uh, if you have any doubts please communicate with me through the email. So all the audience are appreciating you know the talk is very I mean so well very well presented. Thank you. Yeah, and you answered I mean addressed all the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks thank to you. all the audience. Thanks everyone. Thank you Vinu. <laughs>